Great. Thank you everybody for coming to our event tonight. My name is Erin and I am the program director here at Age Inclusion and Media, AIM for short. I will introduce our guest, Kat Candler. Uh, Kat's award-winning feature, Hellion, starring Aaron Paul and Juliet Lewis, played in competition at the Sundance Film Festival. Her short films, Hellion and Black Metal, both premiered at Sundance as well. Her work in television includes directing seven episodes of Ava DuVernay and Oprah Winfrey's highly acclaimed Queen Sugar, episodes of 13 Reasons Why, Sorry for Your Loss, three episodes of the Apple Plus show Home Before Dark, and an episode of Dirty John, the Betty Broderick story. She oversaw season two of Queen Sugar as the producing director, season three as the showrunner, and season three of 13 Reasons Why as the consulting producer. This last year, she directed the pilot for the CW show, The Republic of Sarah, and an episode of Truth Be Told starring Octavia Spencer and Kate Hudson. She's currently developing a TV series inspired by the 2005 film Lords of Dogtown for Sony and IMDb TV. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is super fun. <laughs> um, as we were just, so we were just talking, um, I, I, I think this is a, a little fun, fun sort of story to, to tell people, I guess, that in 2014, I wanted to um, email you after I saw Hellion, and I was really searching for um, films directed by women at the time as a filmmaker myself, and uh, I, I got too scared to email you. <laughs> and, uh, five years later, I found myself at HBO Max, and you came in to pitch uh, with a meeting with my boss, and I told my boss, uh, Kat Candler, oh my god, I, I was going to email her and I never did and I admire her work and I couldn't go to the meeting because there were too many people um and then a couple months after that I didn't tell you this part uh I was in the elevator and then you and Ava got into the elevator with me yes <laughs> and you were with a couple executives and I didn't say anything I just said hello and you you were both very nice to me but I didn't try to start a conversation I didn't want to to be too weird with the executives. I didn't know what kind of meeting you had just had, so. <laughs> I, I don't even remember what other network we were there with, because there's a lot of networks in that building, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it was um, the building with TNT and TBS, and which was also, it's all like Warner Media. Yeah. Um, yeah, but anyway. And I don't think it was called HBO Max at that time. Right. It wasn't called anything yet. Yeah, um, you should have said hi in the elevator <laughs> or like uh, said something. <laughs> you know, I have to tell um, Rebecca that that I finally got to talk to you. Yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> I I want to start with um, uh, you making short films, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering where in your career or in in your life did you start doing that? Was it right after you graduated um, or was it a little bit later? And I know from another program I saw that you talking on, I think, I believe it was with uh, Seed and Spark, um, mm -hmm. you talked about making a lot of short films. And so I'm just like, what, what was that period of time like? Yeah, I think what a lot of people don't realize with a lot of people's careers is this, uh, chapter two or chapter three of your career where nobody's heard of anything that you've done <laughs> but you've been working a lot before that success that sort of lands you in the trades and everybody's like ah, oh, overnight success and you're like no 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 there's like three or four chapters before that chapter that no one really talks about which I think is really important for people to hear those stories because I had made um two feature films before my feature Hellion got into Sundance Two feature films, one I made for like $5,000 the summer of 1999, one I made for about $100,000 summer of 2005, uh, you know, moderate film festivals, like we played at, Sun at South By and some other festivals, but not like Sundance or um, anything like that. And then I, and of course, like both times I was like, ah, oh, the Hollywood floodgates are going to open and I'm going to get like 
three picture deals and all of that. And of course that didn't happen. Um, still hasn't happened those three picture deals, but, um, but during that time, I was also teaching at the University of Texas uh, as an adjunct lecturer. And I was teaching mostly junior and senior level undergrad. And because I was a teacher, I had to be a student again. So I had to kind of be relearning and, and rediscovering uh, just the language of cinema and cinema history. And, and then also I was seeing my students going out and making shorts like every weekend and I wasn't and I was like why am I not making things to the level that these guys are making I mean they're just out experimenting and taking risks and trying things and making all of these short films so when I was teaching was when I went back to the short film format and I had I mean luckily I had access to free equipment being a lecturer there um, I worked with a, like a lot of the students came to work on my short films um, but I just started making stuff again. And honestly, when I was teaching and just making stuff to make it was when my films got better. Um, and when I started to get more attention, uh, and I was just, you know, the first short that I got into Sundance was a short form of Helly in the feature. And it was just a short that I made that summer for fun with a bunch of friends. I had no grand ideas that it would get into any major festivals or anything like that. It was just like, I can grab a bit of cash. I can grab some friends. I have free equipment. Let's go just make literally a, what it's like a six minute short film and didn't think much of it, but it ended up getting into Sundance. But this is also being rejected by Sundance I have no idea how many times. I mean, I submitted everything. I had like countless rejection letters from Sundance and South by and everybody. Um, but it was it was interesting because it was this one little short that I had no grand journey for in my mind that would take my career to or just open up doors. Um, and then I just I kept I and then I started developing Hellion as a feature right out on the heels of the short film. And then that next year I was like, I know it's gonna take me probably a little bit more time to pull the money together for this feature. So I'm gonna make another short film that summer. And that's another short film that got into Sundance but I just kept producing things with my friends and trying things and taking risks. And, um, and so I just, I, I just wanna emphasize that there's a whole few chapters that no one ever talks about. And I think, more often than not, our stories have those chapters that aren't uh, documented in our success stories, you know, so I want people to understand that it does, it takes a beat before whatever that first stepping stone is or success is that you have a whole body of work that you may be proud of, you may, I mean, there's plenty of stuff I would never show anyone that will never see the light of day that lives on VHS tapes in a storage unit in Texas. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I want to make sure everybody understands you create a lot of work that you're excited about, you're not excited about, but it's the process of making stuff, like a lot of stuff. But I love the short form format. format. I really, really, being able to tell a solid story in six to 10, 15 minutes, I think is infinitely harder than a feature film in 90 minutes. Yeah, I that's that's really interesting that the film, so Hellion was um, five to six minutes. Yeah. The short. And, you know, I think, I mean, even my first two short films were 20 minutes long. And then when I was talking with a, a filmmaker friend of mine, we had both said that we wanted to do a five minute short. And in some ways it's, it feels difficult with, wanting to, you know, the way you have to fine tune the story to, yep. to get it there. But um, we both ended up uh, shooting our five minute shorts. And um, I was talking with the crew after we, we did ours and, and just saying, why didn't we do more of these five minute short films? I mean, it yeah. doesn't have to be 
really grand, right? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, even that six minute short film, I probably wrote at least like 10 drafts of those six pages. I just kept refining. And this was again, when I was teaching. So I had all of my story structure really fresh in my brain. I'm like, I need it to hit this and to hit this and shape this again, six pages, but I like hemmed and hawed over those six pages until I was like, okay, now it's ready to go hang out with my friends and press the red button on the camera. And you said that you weren't expecting that Hellion, uh, the short film would get into Sundance or, or open doors, but did you have any sort of career plan in your head for, for this? I, gosh, I mean, I was teaching at UT um, and that was like one class a semester. So like six hours a week, but then a lot of more hours for prep and all of that. And then on the side, I was writing a lot. I was um, just writing feature scripts. I sold a really uh, kind of cheesy teen thriller script that ended up, I think on Lifetime or something like that. Um, and I don't know, I was just writing. I was just trying to create as much as I can. To, and as far as like my grand plan, I remember telling an agent, there was one point where I was like, I didn't have representation. I was like, I have to have representation if things are gonna happen. And so I really tried to get representation and then realized that's not what's gonna make things happen. <laughs> it's actually making things happen for yourself and creating yourself. Um, but I remember telling um, a potential rep at that point, I'm like, I'm gonna have an empire. I'm gonna like, have television shows and I'm gonna make movies and I'm gonna have an empire. I, I, I wanted an empire, I guess. Um, I didn't know how that would happen or, or what steps you had to take. I just know, I knew I had to keep creating. I just had to keep creating and meeting people and, and doing all of the, the, the fun networking groundwork as well, which I know you were saying you're an introvert and it, going into those meetings, I'm just, uh, it can be so painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's not meant for, um, especially I feel like with writers, you know, it's like you spend so much time alone with your thoughts and then you're supposed to go and be this. Like razzle dazzle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you had to learn a lot of that along the way too, then the pitching and, and networking and, and what, when you said that you thought that a rep would be the way to go I think that's what a lot of people think too. yeah I and that was oh gosh I think probably like 20 2005 or four and I didn't have um there was nothing I guess super substantial that I had that was something that they could take out um but it was really when the reps started coming to me because of Pelly in the feature, that's when I was like, oh, okay, this is when the time is right, is when they're seeking me out. They've seen my work. They have they see whatever potential I have. Um, and that's when I, I realized, okay, this is the right time to have a rep, not when I'm like dying to have them, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it, there's the, the desperation of- the Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> but it's hard. I mean, it's so hard because even when you do have representation, and I'm sure a lot of folks on this can speak to this too, is that, you know, you're still doing the work. There's, it's, there's no magical thing that they necessarily bring to the table outside of like connecting you to the people that make sense for you in terms of the kind of projects that you want to do and helping package, but at the end of the day, it's like what you yourself are producing as a writer or finding to put together as a director. Um, it's always like you're the, it's, I mean, you're your biggest champion at the end of the day. Um, we have someone, uh, Melody, who says that the Hellion short was required viewing in her MFA program. Um, Oh, wow. That's cool. Now she makes her intro to screenwriting students view it and read the script. So oh, that's awesome. I love that. Um, did you foresee that happening? <laughs> I definitely have had friends who have reached out 
who teach in university and in high school level too, who have reached out for the script and any kind of ancillary type um, things that I have to go along with it. But um, I think that's just like the biggest treat for me because as a teacher, when I was teaching at UT, I just, those shorts that hit my heart or just like really like nailed a story again in a tiny amount of time. I just loved like there's, um, uh, Lauren Wolkstein's short film, The Strange Ones, that I flipped out for and then had to befriend her. I was like, you're going to be my friend because you're so cool and you tell great stories. Um, and yeah, there's, it's, yeah, it's an honor to be taught in <laughs> classrooms. <laughs> well deserved. Um, and I know we have um, a lot of filmmakers joining us too, and independent filmmakers. And when you mentioned that you had some films that maybe you, you are just in your storage locker that you wouldn't want to look at again, did you feel sometimes like if you were making a short film, were you always progressively getting better or were there times when maybe you, um, you felt like you made a great film, then the next one maybe wasn't as good as you thought or- Absolutely. How do you, how do you say to yourself then, well, maybe, maybe I don't, maybe I shouldn't keep moving forward because I'm, I'm, I'm went backwards or I, or maybe this isn't as good as I thought. Did you just keep making as many? I'm a nerd for the fact that I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a really great teacher. I love teaching. I love being in a classroom, but there's nothing else I love more than making films and telling stories. So I don't really have a backup plan. I never really did. Um, so I just, I just never had another plan for what I was going to do. Um, there could have been a point later in life where it's like, if I'm not able to support myself, which of course I judge no one's journey when it comes to art and, um, and where your path takes you, because we all have different needs and different wants with, uh, you know, whether it's having a family or kids or, or whatever needs that you have in your life. Um, I'm sure there would have been a time, which is honestly, my journey into television was um, out of a need to make money. Like I came out, I don't come from money, um, didn't have a savings account when I went, you know, none of us can afford to go to Sundance as filmmakers. <laughs> We're all like totally broke and like trying to figure out how to pay for the housing so we can premiere our film there. Um, so coming off of of Hellion, I was like, I have to, I have to figure out how to pay my rent. And that's where I um, started taking the steps to get into television. But no, I'd never, I never had a backup plan for good or bad. I don't know. For good, I guess. For good, I never had a backup plan. <laughs> but I, but to be, to, to, it, to also answer your question, um, that never ends in terms of being really proud of something and then making something else where you're like, ah, oh, I kind of misstepped here. Um, or I tried something and I didn't hit it quite the way I was hoping to. Uh, and I think, I hope that's the way all of our journeys continue because then you're just constantly trying to do better and hone your craft or try something new. Uh, I think if we knocked it out of the park every single time, I don't know. I think that might get a little boring. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe that'd be awesome if we hit it out of the park all the time. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah. Um, and that's, so now now your work too is out there to more people. So yeah. do you just like put the blinders on to any criticisms or you don't look at any reviews or do you, or you just? It's interesting. I, I was um, talking to a friend who had a film at Sundance this year and just remembering that time where your film, I mean, this year at Sundance was so hard because you watch a film online and then literally the review comes out five minutes after the Q&A starts, which feels really awful to me that you're like on this high of premiering and then you're like five seconds later looking at reviews seems just really heart heart-wrenching. Um, but it is, I mean, it's hard, you know, 
to read the reviews. I with television, I haven't really been in a space where reviews matter to me so much because it's not necessarily my my story at the end of the day. I'm really proud of so much of the work that I've done in television, but it it doesn't hit as hard as it does when it's like your baby from inception, the first, you know, little bit on the page to like all of the heartbreak and sweat and tears to like clamor together a couple hundred grand to make this film and like all of it, it hits harder when it's in that indie space and you've worked so hard. And I was talking to someone today about a friend of hers was not in the film industry and criticizing a film that they had just seen. And she's like, look, it's really hard to make movies. <laughs> We're literally pushing boulders up Mount Everest to make a movie regardless of whether you love it or not, just appreciate the hard work that went into it. Cause it's, it's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. People, people don't realize that who aren't, who aren't in it, you know? Yeah. It's easier to write a review. If you're not working on. <laughs> infinitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's infinitely hard, easier to pick apart the thing that took like hundreds of thousands of dollars and like all the things that went wrong on the day, the rain, the snow, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, it'll, it'll be interesting when I have another film come out, what it'll feel like, you know, but even older, like now that I'm older, a little, a little bit older from doing Hellion, will I have a little bit more of a maturity when I look at reviews? I don't know. It'll, I'm sure it still hurts no matter how, how old we get. Um, speaking of the transition that you went from um, films to TV, uh, we do have some questions about that. They just people would like to know how you were able to break into television from features and what that path was. And um, uh, let me see here. Um, and and a related question too that, that um, someone has is what advice would you give to those of us career changers coming into the industry at a certain age? And I think that that can also relate, I think, to, to maybe your transition from film to TV. Um, yeah. I mean, to answer the question about career changing, what's cool and exciting about that is you have all of this experience that's non-film related to draw on as a storyteller and a writer. And when it comes to television and particularly television writing, your, your, um, your tools, your gifts are your experiences, your life experiences, because that's what, when you're hiring folks to be in a, a writer's room, absolutely you want talent in there, but you also want people's experiences, especially if they're experiences that you've never had or places you've never lived or you know, journeys you've never taken, that, those are gifts. Those are tools that you take in as a storyteller. Um, the other question about the transition, first off, everybody's journey is wildly different when it comes to transitioning into television. Coming off of Sundance in 2014, I thought, oh, it's gonna be easy to get into television. <laughs> Um, little did I know, not so much. Uh, I spent about a year interviewing with all the studios, all the networks, all the production companies, and you know the the kind of phrase that you get over and over at that time was when you have an episode, then come back to us. But no one was willing to give that first episode. And I had met, Ava DuVernay, when we were both uh, in the Sundance indie film world together, and we'd kind of circled each other for a few years. We both had films at Sundance in 2012. I had the Hellion short and she had Middle of Nowhere. So we, so we were just film festival friends for a few years. And so when she was making Queen Sugar, after about a year of rejection and no's and come back when you have an episode, she, it was just so casual. It was like, hey, I'm making this show uh, would you be interested in directing an episode? Literally just very, very casual. And I'm like, oh my God, yes, please. Knowing, you know, I had just gone through a whole year of rejection and no one would hire. So it, it's a, a beautiful gift of connection and um, film festival friendship that led to that. 
so my entry is a little rare in that respect of like knowing someone who was willing to give the opportunity and the chance to those of us that no one else would, which has been, you know, six seasons of her doing that with all female directors. No one was doing that back in 2015, 2016. So she's created an army of badass female directors out there. Thank goodness. So the hope is that all of those directors, all of those creators that have come out of Ava's world and anybody else are willing to do that for the next generation or the next round of folks coming into the television world. But everybody is different. You know, I've had friends who did countless programs of shadowing programs and all of that and then got into the, uh, got their first job. Or I had friends who were very lucky and someone dropped out of an episode and last minute they had to fill a spot and they got like 10 people to vouch for them really quickly in like 48 hours and then they got the job. So it's totally, totally um, different for everybody. Uh, I think a lot of it is make, doing the groundwork of meeting all of the, the players in the studio system and the network because because of that, People, and people can come to the network and say, oh, Kat's up for this job. Oh, I met Kat in that meeting three months ago or whatnot. So laying the groundwork of meeting everyone. Shadowing programs right now are a little dicey with COVID. Hopefully they'll ha be having more shadowing um, hopefully this year. Uh, but yeah, it's or it's, you see a lot of folks working their way up through the ranks as an editor to a director or script supervisor to a director. I wish I, I, wish I knew the, like, the right answer to that question because everyone asks it and there's no... Yeah, it's, it's almost like frustrating it. and freeing because it's like there's, I think you want to know the path so that you can take the steps to get it. And then when there isn't a, a set path that there's a frustration in that, but it's also freeing to know that, okay, maybe some of the stuff that I'm trying, that's not working. That's okay. I'll go try this or I'll try. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. And I would say like Hellion has opened, a, it's, it's opened a lot of doors to me to like step into and then have the interviews or whatnot. But having, whether it's a short films or a feature film, making a feature film is a huge accomplishment for anyone who does it, whether you're in Sundance or not. It is a huge accomplishment and speaks volumes to the, the persistence, the tenacity, the, you know, all, it, it just, it speaks volumes to how hard of a worker you are and how much the lengths that you'll go to make something that you believe in and, 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 um, and so having and being, that, that's the other thing. It's like just making stuff until they can't ignore you anymore, you know? <laughs> and living in Texas, I lived in Austin for 20 years and that's kind of the, how a lot of us felt. It's like, we're just going to keep making things until they finally admit that we're here, <laughs> you know? Which was cool because one year there were 10 of us at Sundance in 2013. It's like, you can't ignore us anymore. We're around, we're making wow. pretty cool stuff. So there's a really thriving film community in Austin. Huge, oh my gosh. Like when I was coming up, like in 1999, I met David Lowry, who I'm sure most people know at this point, Green Knight, Pete's Dragon. Um, we were pen pals over internet when internet was, internet was very new. Um, Yen Tan, uh, James Johnston, Toby Hallbrooks, Heather Courtney, Margaret Brown, who just had a film at Sundance. I mean, there's a huge, Jeff Nichols, David Green was down there at one point, Rick Linklater. I mean, there's a huge, beautiful community of filmmakers and we all rose together. I mean, Rick was fine, Rick Linklater was fine, but we all kind of grew up together in the film community, which is again, like meeting Ava in the indie film community, so many, opportunities that I've had have come from my peers 
in the film world and the people that I've collaborated with or grown up with in my journey, which is the beauty and a beautiful thing to work alongside your friends and people you love and you trust and are excited to see every day in the trenches. And, and so people who are tuning in from places outside of Los Angeles. Um, I love, have, yeah. you don't have to live in LA. I'm like dying to go back to Texas. I moved to, I moved to Los Angeles to run Queen Sugar because I had to be in a writer's room here. But I prize filmmakers that don't live in New York or LA because the stories that you have to tell, the experiences that you have outside of the industry and outside of the Hollywood system are probably far more interesting than some that are a lot that are coming from within the system. I want to hear the stories from, I, I don't know where everybody's from, but communities I've never been to. That's what... I think really brings me to the theater, brings me to a television show and creating your community, your art community, your film community, wherever you are. I, I'd rather live in that little sphere of artists, I think. Yeah. It's always good, it's always good to hear that, you know, because because I think. Isn't it, doesn't it seem like most everyone in Los Angeles is from somewhere else? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when we were coming up in Austin, there was a, the coolest Seattle scene. There was a really cool scene in Columbia, Missouri. And we all sort of became independent film friends because we would travel to festivals together. And then again, we all rise together and start making things together. And at this point in my career, I just want to make stuff with my friends things I love with my friends because it's so hard <laughs> you know <laughs> um sort of related to that uh someone has asked uh, what is the biggest creative challenge in going from features to episodic um they said they're in that process right now yeah I think I mean there's a ton of there's tons of challenges and that television is such a fast medium it's you know you're going from shooting a feature in 25 to 30 days to shooting half of the feature in seven to 10. Um, so the speed of television can be daunting. Uh, but I think for me, the hardest part is that you don't have full ownership over episodic. And after a little while, you really miss that ownership and that creative um, just just being the creative boss all around. Uh, the beautiful thing about television is you meet a lot of rad people. You get to hone your craft. You get to work with, I, you know, I'd never worked with a crane until I got onto Queen Sugar. And I was like, what do I, this is really cool. What do I do with it? I'm not used to, <laughs> even like a dolly. I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. We have a dolly. Oh my God, we have two cameras, what? Um, so you get to definitely hone your craft on other people's dimes, but again, like it's the creative ownership that I miss coming from the independent film world. And there's just a lot more committee members that uh, you're responsible to. So yeah, I think the creative ownership is for me the hardest part. Um, let's see, someone also has asked, um, well, Evie has asked, how did you learn to pitch comfortably? Because <laughs> so, um, I laugh heartily. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's funny because we were saying like the first time I ever pitched was at that HBO Max meeting, but yeah. And terrified I was absolutely terrified I usually have like I have my laptop and I'm usually the writer director so I have uh, a full presentation my powerpoint presentation I have my laptop in front of me and my notes so I can sit in the meeting and be talking and then navigating my powerpoint presentation and reading my notes I practice so much like I, we actually have a, a pitch tomorrow 
some friends and I are doing and we've practiced that pitch I don't know at least like 30 times <laughs> you know and we've tweaked and we were refined and we've changed the pictures on the slides and we've had you know different folks come in and watch our pitch and give notes and it's you're just trying to get and, you, and you're, we also do <laughs> practice Q and A's like, okay, what questions do you think? And we have like a whole list of questions and then all of our answers and we do a mock, Q it's so nerdy. We do a mock Q and A of like, so what do you think about the arc of this character? And they're like, well, let me tell you about, you know, it's super, super nerdy, but we practice a ton. In the Zoom age, I actually love pitching over Zoom because I can have my notes, my people's faces, my PowerPoint presentation. And it looks like, like I can be reading my notes and I'm like talking and it looks like I'm off the cuff, but I'm really like reading. Um, so I've gotten a lot more comfortable over Zoom. It's the going, so it'll be interesting when we come back, if we come back to in-person because it's the sitting in the lobby waiting, it's the traffic getting to the pitch. It's like the second guessing after you leave the meeting or the, you know, the handshaking and the small talk, all of that like ramps my nerves up big time. But in Zoom, I get all my stuff together. I've got my like water, my Diet Coke and you do the thing and then you're done and you walk out and you're like in your pajama pants or whatever. <laughs> I'm in yoga pants right now. Um, I'll probably be in yoga pants when I pitch tomorrow. There's just more of a comfort level when you're at home and in your own space, but I, it's a lot of rehearsing to get to that comfort level of pitching. Well, did there happen to be anyone really famous in the lobby that day at HBO Max? I, I can't remember because there was, there'd always be, it was such a small lobby and there were some days it would just be filled with like I think one day it was like Lenny Kravitz and Tina Fey and, you know, um, I can't remember who the other person was. And I was just thinking, you know, the people who are coming in who are newer, who are, have to sit there with Lenny Kravitz and <laughs> Tina yeah. Fey. And I don't think he was wearing a shirt, you know, it was like, they're all, it, and it was really small. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be super daunting. I mean, the thing is like, it's, there's so many, there's not a, a ton of rhyme or reason to decisions. I've kind of, I feel like everybody's mandates at networks are changing like by the hour. Um, you have no idea if you're pitching a thing about pirates and they already have two shows in the works in development about pirates and that's why they're passing. Um, it, it's, I've been, I've pitched so many projects in the last two years that I don't take it personally at all. Like I'll, I know like, again, like they could have already have a project in the, they're, it's not in their mandate, whatever, which is fine. So it, 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 it's a hard thing to spend six months, a year developing a thing figuring out the story, figuring out the eight episodes, figuring out the three seasons practicing your pitch, going out for your two weeks of pitches to all the networks and then getting passed on by everybody. It's heartbreaking. It's so, so heartbreaking, but you kind of get used to it, <laughs> which is super sad and a little depressing, um, which is why for me, it's, I have a lot more things um, in the pipe. Like I have a lot more things that I'm developing because it does feel a little bit like a numbers game of like, oh, if you go and pitch five things, maybe one will get picked up and then the one will get picked up. You'll write a pilot. Maybe that pilot will be greenlit to a writer's room. Maybe not. Maybe you'll go shoot the pilot. <sighs> Television is like an obstacle course <laughs> that you hope you have enough endurance to make it to the 26 mile marker. Um, it's it's long and it's arduous and it's heartbreaking and it's joyful uh but you can't take it personal yeah you know one thing i i noticed when i was at hbo max is how many really famous people would come in and still be rejected because absolutely one show of 
you know, they can only take one cooking show set in someone's house or they can only do, you know, like you said, yep. one show about pirates. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Last summer, we were all hearing about these gigantic packages that were getting passed on by everybody. And when you hear that, it sucks to hear that, but it's also like kind of heartening to be like, oh, well, if they're passing on this A-lister, then maybe there's a little bit of even ground to be pitching on. But yeah, it is. It's it's helpful to hear for me at least that huge heavy hitters get passed on for again for whatever reason who knows mm -hmm. and when you when you were transitioning to tv and yeah and so you were you were directing mm -hmm. first and then now you've been developing and writing and when you were um show running you were involved in the writing yeah. process yeah um, was there a learning curve that Huge. happened between writing for film and writing for TV? Totally. Yeah. It, 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 again, a rare graduation from director to showrunner in that after season one of Queen Sugar, Ava asked, do you want to be a producing director next season? I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'll figure it out. Next season, do you want to be a showrunner? It's like, I've never been in a writer's room. I know how to tell a story. We'll figure it out. Um, so there was definitely, it was a lot of freely admitting what I didn't know and being very open with my writers who had been in, some had been in television for a long time. Some were brand new from the indie world, but being really honest about what I knew and what I didn't know, um, but also being very um, true to knowing that my name was going to be on every episode and making trying to make sure in my own way of making it the best it could be and um but yeah it was it was definitely a learning curve for sure but i don't know i think we innately know like like as a producing director my job was to helm the directors and make sure they knew or they had what they needed um they were all brand new to television so I'm like what did I want or need to know coming into this job being a teacher from UT like you know I created little packets to give all the directors like this is what a tech scout looks like this is what a tone meeting looks like and then creating the lookbook of this is what the style of this show is um I think if you're really part of this job regardless of whether you're a director or showrunner producing director staff writer is just being super organized especially as a showrunner because you're juggling a gazillion balls in the air and praying not to drop too many of them um but it's just being super super organized and that's not only you know just even developing stuff i have to be super organized so i know like this is where this project is at this is what i need to write on this project this rewrite is due I need to have, I've got this pitch coming up. So I'm very, I had a life coach that was free from Sundance for a year. Thank, thank them so much. Cause it really organized me. And this was back in 2015 of how to continue my career and how to track what I wanted to track. And so I have a piece of paper. It's actually three pages now every week I update it. I have my goals at the top of what I want to accomplish every year. I have every project that I'm working on and what I've accomplished that week or what I want to accomplish next week. I'm just hyper-organized about what I want to do because I want to do a lot. I want to, I want to have that empire someday, <laughs> you know? So I, I, and, you know, time is bleeding. I'm just like, Let's figure out how to do it all. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't hear about that, you know, that process of, of sort of the, the behind the scenes, gritty, having to get organized. Um, yeah. That's, that's, I think that's also great advice for anyone who is um, watching this right now, just organize, get, you know, find whether you need someone else to come in and help you or, you know, find a system. Yeah, it's huge for me, really, really huge, because I want to do a lot in my little lifetime. <laughs>
And do, do you feel when we're um, thinking about lifetimes and thinking about age and um, did you, is, is age inclusion something that um, you ever thought about when you started or is it something that you think about now, whether it's for um, the, the types of stories that you're, that you want to tell or the people that you want to work with or even for yourself when you think, you know, when you think of Hollywood and there's so many <laughs> um, challenges for sure. people. Um, there hasn't been a, you know, there is a Me Too movement. We, we've had um, BLM movement that at least raises these issues up in the more yeah. general public, but there hasn't really been one for age inclusion at this point. And I'm just wondering, you know, some of your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think again, what is so valuable in a, in a writer's room as a storyteller is experience and also just your journey. And the more journey you have and the more experience, especially like varied experience, again, that's, that's a gift. Those are gifts that you're giving to a room. Um, yeah, I mean, I've only put together one writer's room so far. But when I was thinking about it and this, you know, it depends on the story you're telling, but I'm thinking of all the things in the story or in that season that we want to talk or speak to or tell the story of. And you're trying to get this experience and this experience and this experience and try and create an Avengers of, of experiences, if that sounds really silly, but you know what I mean? <laughs> So to have all of the same experience in a writer's room isn't really helpful and seems really redundant. And um, yeah, I, and I have, yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm looking forward to being able to put together that next writer's room for something and thoughtfully assess, thoughtfully just being aware of again the experiences and um the talent yeah all of that it's funny I thought I was I remember seeing reality bites when I was a lot younger and thinking I remember I think Winona writers like I was gonna make something by the time I was 23 and if you don't make something by the time you're 23 your life is over and I remember 23 coming and going and being like, oh my God, I've got nothing to look forward to. <laughs> and now I'm far from 23. And like, it just gets better and better and better in a weird way. Um, the adventures that we've had, the, the process, I mean, I get kind of going back to spending six months to a year developing a television show. It can be really heartbreaking when it doesn't go, but hopefully that, that adventure that you had for a year developing it with your friends or by yourself, hopefully with your friends, was fucking awesome. It was really fun. You create your own little writer's room that you hang out in on Zoom for like once a week and you're just talking story. I love that. And that's what I get to take, even if something gets passed on. Like we had a really fun, fun time creating those characters and building that world and like just talking story, you know? And anyone I, I digress. Can do that. And yeah. anyone can do that. It, it, you don't, they don't have to it's be free. <laughs> where you are at in your career. They can, anyone can be working on. Yeah, there was a year I was I was shooting Home Before Dark season two in Vancouver and I would be in production, but every Sunday on Zoom, two friends and I would spend a few hours just hashing out the story for this thing we were gonna go pitch. And I looked forward to it. It was a little bit of a, a break from the madness of being on set, but it was like, oh, okay, we're just gonna talk story and characters and this weirdo world that we've built. And I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's nice that, um, I guess with Zoom, I guess a positive from the pandemic, 
we can say that is that we can connect with people when we're not in the same location or like if you're on set and you can still connect with people over Zoom. Yeah, my co-writers live in Georgia, in Texas, in LA, like all over, you know? I, I value that from my new friend, Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one, we got something out of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a couple questions here. Um, um, one, uh, so Karina asks, do you have tips for networking as an early career filmmaker? Oh, I, uh, I hate parties and all of that stuff so much. I'm like the wallflower who just wants to go home and put her PJs on. And, um, but with that being said, I did, um, early on, I did force myself to do a lot of that. Uh, I remember I would go, every year I would go to IFP in New York with whatever project I was able to submit just so I could do the rounds of meeting whether it was producers or financiers or whatnot which is interesting because folks I met like a decade ago are now <laughs> heads of studios and you know networks and stuff um, so that's an interesting turn of events uh, you know in Austin Austin Film Society was sort of our hub for Texas film and I got involved quite a bit in the Austin Film Society, whether it was going, we had rough cut screenings that local filmmakers would do. And I would go to rough cut screenings and be a part of their process and post. Um, I would go to parties. <laughs> Even again, I wouldn't go for long because I'm so terrible at them. I literally just want to go home. They make me really nervous. Uh, I, but I, I definitely did. I, you know, I would apply to a lot of the programs, whether it was film independent, IFP, Austin Film Society had a lot of programs um, that they did. I would apply to Sundance Labs. I never got into Sundance Labs. Um, They're tough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Um, but it is important. And I think, and also, again, going back to making those short films, taking, being on the festival circuit, I think was the best networking experience for a lot of us because you'd go to the shorts program, you see this amazing short film, you go up to the filmmaker afterwards, after the Q&A and, and talk to the filmmaker, or you'd point, figure out who the cinematographer was and you go meet that cinematographer. Like um, Andrew draws Palermo who just shot, beautifully the green knight i met years ago because he shot anna fidel's short film the gathering squall uh long long ago hannah did a, a show called a teacher but we met on the festival circuit a gazillion years ago and i remember going up to andrew because we had shorts in the same program like i want to work with you and he's like i want to work with you and then we ended up making a short film that got into sundance so that the film festival circuit truly is one of the, the best networking because you're just appreciating each other's art and, and being able to collaborate at a time where you're all kind of coming up, again, coming up together. And then people are getting nominated for Oscars <laughs> and Gotham Awards, and stuff, which is great, really cool, like super cool to, to see that evolution. So it goes back to just keep making films and- It really does. Films. Um, let's see. Um, well, someone said, how did you get your first job on TV? I don't know if that meant- um, It yeah. was the directing. That was, that was the directing with Ava. That we, okay. Yeah. I, um, everybody's route is different. And I took the route of not working on sets. So I know a lot of folks come out to LA or New York or wherever and just start peeing and kind of work their way up that. But I took the route of working in a bookstore. I worked at an AI company and I would make my little films on my vacation time during my summers. Again, like I, I didn't come from money. So I had, you know, I had to pay my rent with these full-time jobs. 
and then do everything in all of my spare time that I had. So I would come home from my bookstore job and I would just be writing the feature that I was hoping to make next summer. Um, I forgot what the question was, but hopefully. Well, yeah, then you just said, how did you get your first job on speed? Right. I, um, but I wasn't sure if, I thought, was there more, is there acting credits that I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure yeah. if was referring to, <laughs> you also had been in a. No. <laughs> um, and yeah, there's a, there's a, we have time for a few more questions here. Sure. Um, and so now that you're in this certain place, um, are you able to make more decisions based on what you want to write and direct? Because yes. I, I also noticed that you have, uh, you, you do a certain type of story, it seems like, mm -hmm. that has either, it, it's very intense with character um, portrayals or um, like an internal story or societal. Um, so that's, you're, you're able to, to choose that. It's not that you had to take whatever was being offered, um, you, you could. Yeah, I mean, after, after Hellion, you know, Queen Sugar was the dream television show to transition with because Ava's sensibility matched so much with mine in, you know, the, the indie spirit of it, the beautiful drama, the gorgeous characters, like it just matched so well with the stories that I wanted to tell and the kinds of stories I wanted to tell and just the visual sensibility. And then from there, after Queen Sugar, like there were some shows that I got, um, not offered, but was able to they asked if I wanted to interview for that just weren't my jam. You know, I just, they weren't things that I felt like my skill set and my sensibility matched with. And you're, and I'm also always thinking like, am I going to service this story the way the story needs to be serviced? And if not, then I'm not the right person. Like I'm not the right person to do a half hour um, sitcom. It's not my sensibility. Um, so I'm always, so yeah, I, because I was used to not having any money, having a little bit of money, I'm like, oh my God, I'm rich. You know, <laughs> I can, I can buy peanut butter this week. It's amazing. Like, this is great. So I was used to living on very little if to nothing. So I was able to make choices that I wanted to make, um, from job to job and from show to show. And then you get it to a point where you've worked with whether it's showrunners or other directors or producing directors that then have shows that they're working on that you get you're like ah they're working on that one I want to work with that person so then you're on that show um but yeah and then you know with my with my reps I basically tell them look all things Texas punk rock heavy metal working class that's the kind of stuff that I really gravitate towards. And there, and I'm very specific about the kinds of things, the kinds of shows, the kinds of stories, the sensibility of what I love. And it's been great because they're very specific with what they come back to me with, knowing I'm not gonna make that gigantic romantic comedy. I'm not the person to do it. I would make a terrible romantic comedy. I'd be everybody would be so depressed at the end of it. Um, so it's not only like what, it, it's also this knowing what my sensibilities match with and service and don't service. But yeah, I do like, I'm in a place where I'm really lucky to be choosy and, and say no a lot. And it's okay to say no. It's totally okay to say no. I have mad respect for saying no to things you just don't want to do. And it's not the thing you want your name on. It's not the thing you, the story that you feel comfortable putting out into the world. It's totally cool. You don't have to. There's going to be something beautiful on the other side of that no. It's going to be the empire. It's going to be the empire. <laughs> yeah. In Texas. Yeah, in Texas. Um, um, we have, uh, 
few more questions here. Um, uh, so we had, if you made a feature film that didn't go the way you wanted and didn't end up being a calling card, would you recommend making a short film next or going for another feature? I would say, I mean, I would say make another, make a short. Like the beautiful, and that's what I did. Like I made two features and then I made a ton of shorts and I made a really cute little kid comedy short that did really well on the festival circuit. Sesame Street called me as a result of it, which was really cool. I made a dark heavy metal drama. I made a weird little dramedy about kids setting fire in their yard. I was just was trying to play with different stories and formats and um, budget, like visual languages and uh, and then you have all these opportunities to go to festivals again, which is again, like I love so much of my, so many of my favorite memories of being in the indie world is like those, when you're traveling to the Maryland Film Fest and you're hanging out with all these really cool filmmakers that you love and admire and just like really rad people and you spend the whole weekend together. Um, those are some of my really prized memories of, of film career you know it's making those it's forging those friendships it's appreciating it's appreciating everybody else's art and learning and growing um but it, I mean if I had millions of dollars to spare I might make another feature or two <laughs> I'd probably make like five or six features um but that wasn't my situation I was able to make these short films for little you know little to nothing uh, and so I just made a ton of them. That's great. Um, I have, there's a question here that is about sexism. And mm -hmm. uh, I have a question to add to that. So from Erica, she says, um, have you encountered much blatant sexism along your journey? Um, and have you felt being a woman made you fight to where um, it's more difficult? Um, or you're more difficult. Um, and I'm wondering, related to that, since you started working with Ava DuVernay right away in TV and you had this other, you know, woman filmmaker and things started to change too. Uh, part of the reason that I wanted to go to LA was because I saw more women in TV. Yeah. Um, making, making TV. Um, so what, what was your experience? What did, did you? I, I mean, Queen Sugar for me is like the pinnacle of, of a family and an experience of making something where you get to really spread your creative wings and you're um, surrounded by the best hearts and good humans and rad artists. So I kind of started I had, the bar was set really, really high at the beginning. I'm like, oh, this is what it's going to be like. And then you realize, oh, no, 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 it's not always like this. In fact, it's rarely like this. <laughs> um, I definitely have encountered, uh, I've been in situations where I was talked down to, I was um, belittled, and I definitely had to stand up for myself and say, you can't talk to me like that. Um, and it, it sucks that it has to get to that point. It's been, it's only been twice in all of the television time, the years that I've been in television, um, but it sucks. It's a sucky situation, but I definitely had to voice like, mm, no, you can't don't talk to me like that um and did you feel that you could voice it because there were other people around you who were supportive of you that you felt comfortable yeah with? yeah I mean in those two situations like the the crews were amazing like I had such cool people that I was working with and it was like that one bad apple that um and then, but then to find out 
the beautiful thing is once you start directing, you have this uh, web of other directors that we all talk. We all talk about who we love and who we aren't so, isn't so fun to work with. And I, I remember talking to a friend of mine who worked with the same person and she was like, oh, I had the same exact experience. It's like, I'm not crazy. And it's not just me. It's like, it's a lot of other ladies, unfortunately. Um, but again, the beautiful thing is there, I mean, specifically with Queen Sugar, there's this gorgeous sisterhood of directors out there. And we all have dialogues about who the great cinematographers that we get to work with or the ADs or, you know, showrunners that we love to work with. And we're all sort of recommending each other for things. So having, having those candid and open conversations with my directing sisters uh, is so valuable and so, um, and just, it, 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 there's, there's strength in that sisterhood. It's, it sounds like a dream team. <laughs> 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 yeah. It's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, we have, um, let's see, so many great questions. Um, just a little time left. Uh, we have someone who asked, I feel I have many ideas but struggle to, to finish and sometimes even start writing them. How do you develop the discipline to see a script through until the end? Yeah. Oh, it's hard. It's totally hard. I think we all go through that. Um, I, when I was back in Texas, I would do, I would go and spend like a week in a hotel and know like, this is where I have to get by the end of this week. And I would be determined to like, know that I'm going to get the first draft out on the page. And then once I have that first draft, I, I love the, the subsequent drafts where you're like, you have your framework and you have your structure or your, your building blocks and now you're just shaping. Um, I, I, right now, like there's a, I'm waiting notes um, tonight actually that once I get those notes, I know that I have the script for a week that I have to turn over my notes to my co-writer who's, I mean, we just give ourselves deadlines of like, this is when this has to be done. This is when this has to be done. And I also treat right back in the day, I would treat writing as a job, even though I wasn't getting paid for it. I would, I went to Einstein's bagels in Austin on campus because I was teaching across the street and I would get there, I think like 7 a.m. in the morning every day. I had my booth. I had my free refills of Diet Coke, my little honey wheat bagel that I would eat every morning. And I would sit there for hours. And I knew that I would sit there from like 7 a.m. to like 10 or 11 a.m. And I would just write and I would just work. And those were like dedicated hours that I was clocking in and clocking out every day. Um, but I also, I give uh, a lot of credit to walking now, taking long walks in the morning every day, doing yoga, like making sure that I'm not like writing crazy hours where my brain is just fried. But back in the day, I would, I would clock in and I would clock out and I would have my structure, even though I wasn't getting paid, I still treated it like a job. That's great advice, dude. Find a booth in a bagel shop somewhere <laughs> or a coffee shop where they'll let you sit for four hours. <laughs> you know, I think that, um, uh, who was it who said, um, I think it was Barry Jenkins wrote, said he wrote Moonlight all in a cafe, the entire thing. All oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I remember I worked at Book People in Austin for five years and I remember seeing, um, uh, Luke Wilson came in to our coffee shop down the little city for weeks. He was writing the Wendell Baker story, which I don't think many people saw was shot in Austin, but I remember seeing him coming in and he would just come in and write. And we're like, oh, it's Luke Wilson from Bottle Rocket. It was such, you know, it was cool, but also I'm like, ah, 
he's actually really disciplined at doing his thing. <laughs> Putting in the work, imagine that. <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I mean, that's another thing you don't see. You just see the success. You don't always see all the work that led up to that. Absolutely, yeah. All the many, many, many drafts, the many bad drafts that will, again, are in some storage unit in Austin on a VHS tape. <laughs> um, and let's see you. Um, what question shall we end on? Um, so many great ones. Um, let's see. Um, do you see, is there a recurring theme that you see coming through in your work? I mean, you, you spoke about a little bit along those lines um, about what you make. Um, and so. Yeah, I, I definitely deal with parent child a lot. I love a good family drama, like give me my running on empty back in the day, Sydney Lumet type dramas that they don't really make so much anymore in the Hollywood system. Like I love like Mosquito Coast, Peter Weir. Ugh, I love, love, love. Like I love, again, the blue collar working class families, um, whether it's you know in the short film in a heavy metal family or whether it's a refinery family, I just I love I love great characters. I love complicated characters. Uh, I'm inching my way. I've been inching my way into the horror world for the last two years. But again, it's like it's all family drama with like horror elements at the Ooh. end of the day. Um, and talking a little bit about sci-fi lately as well. Again, just at the root of it, it's family dramas with sci-fi elements. Because at the end of the day, th those are the great movies where you're emotionally wrought by these journeys that these characters are taking their relationships, whether it's on a spaceship or on an island or, you know, doesn't matter. Um, but I just, I love people. I love humans and I love, I love dissecting them. So. Well, you're good at doing that. So <laughs> keep doing that. Thank you. <laughs> and is, can you tell us about anything that is coming out or we should look for? Oh God. We just have to be surprised. And, and yeah, maybe surprised. I, again, like everything, what we do, like whether, it manifests on a screen or not. It's so much about enjoying the process. And I've enjoyed the process the last few years of living in um, 1970s skater world to living in, um, living in Texas a lot. I, again, just my agents, I'm like, just give me Texas stories, whether it's like the Texas punk rock scene or whatever. Um, but I don't know. I, there's so many things that I want to happen. I'm trying to like manifest in my mind to happen. But you just realize that it's a big, it's a big system. It's a big system that we're up against, which again is why I'm like, just want to work with my friends so I can savor the process. And the joy at the end, if it makes it to a screen, beautiful but also going back to independent film like I've been making a point to go back to some independent stories that hopefully we can get off the ground because going back to what you asked at the very or somebody asked about television at the very beginning I want full creative ownership again over every decision over the schedule over <laughs> all all the decisions I want to be a huge part of and have all the ownership of like we did it, this is how I did it. We did it my way. We all collaborated in a beautiful family. Um, but I own every decision that you see on screen for good or bad. And you can't do that in television because there's so many hands and so many people uh, putting the ingredients together. 
you know, that's, I think that there's a, I think it was Steven Spielberg had some sort of quote about when he just had um, a camera and was just shooting, that was like the most free that he felt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's like chasing that. You're chasing, you're constantly chasing the magic of that independent film that you made that summer in Texas when it was three digit heat, but you were with your friends and you were scrappy and dirty and like, absolutely, you're always chasing that magic. So when everybody's like struggling through the independent film world, you're like, savor, it's like, savor every second, every second, (laughs) because I swear to God, you're going to want to go back there. (laughs) When everything goes wrong and yes. Problem you're gonna solved. love it. <laughs> you're gonna savor those memories for decades. <laughs> well, thank you so much for for joining us tonight. Oh my god, it was super fun. Thank you. Oh, so um, insightful and um, so much to say. Not only you know on on two aspects, two sides of it: the the um, independent filmmaking and then. TV. It's, you know, not everyone has that, yeah, that experience. So that's, that's really unique. And thank you. Um, you know, I'm sorry, it took me eight. Oh years. my gosh, why did you not <laughs> talk to me in the elevator? <laughs> Anyone who's watching, if there's someone you admire, just well, say, you admire, like, yes, or just say, I really love that film, or I love whatever. I swear <laughs> to God, it like, it fills your heart when someone appreciates what you do or like feels connected to what you do. It's like, it means the world. It totally means. I have like a letter from a kid who saw Hallian and just wrote this beautiful letter to me and stuff on my wall. Cause it's, that's why we do what we do, you know? That's great. Yeah. Well, next time, you know. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> And thanks to everybody who participated and asked questions and we're here. Thank you guys. Yes, thank you so much to everyone who, who joined and um, please you know follow us on Twitter, check out our website. You can also you can go to the website, sign up for our newsletter um, and find out about any more events that we have coming up or just send us an email at info at ageinclusionandmedia.org and we will get back to you. So thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs> All right, you guys take care. All right, you too. Bye. Bye